Okay. Well, good evening to you. Uh, afternoon, I guess it really is. Uh, my name is Richard Ellington. I'm a, a born and bred Carborough boy, third generation uh, in, the, in the, the town of Carborough. And um, what I want to talk to you today is, the, uh, is talking about the school systems that we had here in the area. Uh, Orange County was uh, uh, got got actually got some public schools started uh, in uh, the late eighteen uh, about eighteen eighty is when they actually uh, got started with public schools and whatever. And of course, this was this was a segregated South then, so you know, we had you know that, what they was been referred to as the colored schools and the, and the, the white schools. And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today, and we'll uh, get started here just right, right now. The picture you see here is a fellow named Mac Watts. Mac was my next door neighbor growing up. Uh, and uh, he was an, just an incurable camera bug, as I say here. He took photos, all of the stuff all over town. And he was very interested in Carver Town history and uh, actually collected a, 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 a quite a collection of some you know, old buildings and, and folks and that sort of thing uh, over the years. And his family was kind enough to, to donate uh, a, a piece of a slide collection he had to me in hopes that I would preserve it and use it and you know, continue continue to talk about Carver history. So some of the, the photos that you see here today will, will have been Mr. from Mr. Watts and, and uh, I'm very grateful to his family for it. Also what you're going to see is you're going to see my interpretation or my, my slant on some things and you may or may not agree with me but I'm, as to why things were the way they were, or why they you can say become the way they were. So, uh, and but we could talk about that if you have if you want to question things. Like um, Charles said about we're going to I'll cover some of the schools and we'll have a little break with some questions, and then we'll uh, uh, attack the uh, attack the rest of the uh, the uh, this um, <clears throat> right here. But anyway, the the community that became Carver had a public school system in the white community even before the town was incorporated in 1911. First, most of the schools were operated by Orange County, uh, and until the early 20th century, Chapel Hill was part of the Orange County system. But in 1909, the Chapel Hill created their own system, and uh, uh, and they were separate and apart. But Carboro continued to be an Orange County school until 1958. Uh, until the mid 1960s, all of Orange County schools, including Chapel Hill, were segregated by race. Uh, we'll start by looking at the earliest white schools and then look at the earliest colored schools and follow, uh, finish up with the school systems that we know today. Like I say, this presentation is based on a lot of my personal knowledge and opinions and, and local research. I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at, at records in the old Orange County uh, uh, school board uh, minutes and whatever that date back to 1885. So, but I, what got me started on this, I was trying to find out just when, when did the first schools actually appear in Carborough? And it just blossomed from there. So uh, let's get started. This is a map that shows um, the Orange County and, and it, this indicates schools that were in the county in 1922. And uh, there were a number of schools there, but there were a number of old private academies in, in the, the county that people were, are not really aware of at the time before there were, there were ever actually public schools. And we'll see on the map here that they they are, these are the townships, you know, in the county, and many of these are referenced by, you know, churches and whatever. So, um, well, here's the actual full-blown map, and then I'm going to do another. Here's here's just the area of Carver Chapel Hill area, and you'll see there are schools are denoted with circles. Just a single circle, as you see here. This is Carborough, uh, is just a single circle, and if you see there's a circle in a circle, it indicates that it's a colored school. And uh, you see that there are a number of schools indicated here uh, all over this end of the county. Um, you know, here's, uh, th this is out what we now know as Jones Ferry Road. And here's Damascus Church. So you see there's a white school and a colored school. And if, you, if you've ever know anything about that, that piece of Jones Ferry Road, there is a little street out there that says Old School Road. And I'm not sure which one of the schools it is, but it's uh, definitely there. First, we'll talk about some Andrews Academy, which uh, a lot of people don't know anything about. It's it was a white school. It was a, a private academy run by a fellow named Calvin Andrews, for whom the the 
the little Calvander community its name. They, they bastardized his name and made it made it Calvander out of Calvin Andrews. But anyway, he had a, a, a little private school that was located behind the, the, the convenience store that you see at the intersection there now. It was located up behind that store. And uh, Calvin himself lived across the street uh, in, in, in the, uh, the forks of uh, what is now Deerland Road and Old Hillsborough Road. A friend gave me this. Uh, this was a receipt for payment of tuition. This, this lady uh, had her, her dad actually was a student there, and this was a receipt they got in 1905 for uh, paying tuition for, for her dad to attend school at the Andrews Academy. This is Carbar's first elementary school, and it's located on Center Street. The building is still there. This picture dates, I believe, to about the 1940s, but I'm not for sure. Uh, and the school was in this, located in this building from some, sometime before 1900, not exactly sure when. But uh, sometime before 1900, uh, and it, it was a school until about 1910. Uh, it was later used as a small knitting mill, and then it became a private residence, which it is, currently is right now. It's located on Center Street. It's a, when you, if you turn off of Weaver uh, Street, it's, I believe, the third house on the left. It's, it has a green roof. This is a picture of some folks sitting on the porch of that building after it uh, became a private residence. And the significance to me is that this little lady sitting here is my grandmother. I'm my, uh, uh, and, and the little, the, the pretty little thing sitting right here is my mother. This picture was taken about 1915. My, my family, my mother's family lived in Durham and worked, my grandfather worked in the urban mills and when Julian Carr bought this mill. He ended up moving over here and lived on the, the controversial corner where it was supposed to be the CVS uh, drugstore was to be built. It's never been. That's where my mother lived and, and grew up until she married. But th they knew people that lived in this house, apparently. Here's a picture of Mr. Watts, a uh, picture from Mr. Watts. And this this uh, Picture of the teacher here was supposed that her name was Miss Purifoy, according to Mr. Watts, and he had he had made up some rules as to what was, how things were observed. He was he tended to be a little uh, he was a little uh, a bit of a joker, but uh, it's uh, kind of cute. And here he is talks another picture of Mr. Watts. He's talking about teaching the reading, writing, arithmetic, and the rich reward of practicing the golden rule. And um, this was supposed to be the curriculum at Carver Elementary. This is the uh, second school that was built in Carborough for the white kids, of course. Um, this building is located or was located uh, where the animal hospital is now sitting. And that, this building was torn down in order to build the animal hospital. This is actually the side of it. Uh, over here, this is the front of the building on the left hand side. It's facing Main Street. Uh, and this was the back and this was the entire school population uh, sometime after 1910. In 1910, when they moved into the building, this is the front of what was what was seen from Main Street, uh, and um, it was of, of the building. And after after the, the school was uh, uh, was no longer located there, the uh, Methodist Church, which was located the original Methodist Church, Carver Methodist Church, was located just to the right uh, on Main Street. Uh, until uh, I think 1950 when they moved into the, the current building they have now. Julian Carr. Now, what would Julian Carr have to do with schools? You know, everybody knows who he is and, and the reputation he has of being, you know, a, a white supremacist or whatever, but Julian Carr, you know, owned the mills. And Julian Carr did actually had some, some very, um, I'll say, advanced ideas about mill operation. Most mills, you know, the in the South, you hear a lot of the contention between you know, the mill owners and the mill workers and the mill strikes and whatever, you know, and they, all kinds of things. Well, that didn't happen in Carborough and in the mill tier. Uh, Julian Carr did something very unique. He had, a, he had a, what he called the Workers' Congress, and he had re representatives from all areas of the mills who would meet and talk about how to improve the way they, their job is, how they could improve, improve conditions, how they could, of course, get more work done out of the same people for the same amount of time. And he, he was very, uh, in some ways, very advanced there. And that, this was 
I, I'd never heard of it ever happening before. But, but one thing that he also did, I got from someone who was a student uh, at this time, uh, circa 1910, 1915, was that he actually paid school teachers to teach at night uh, so that kids who worked in the mill during the day could, uh, could go to school at night. And he did this free of charge for the community. Um, and that's, that, that's, as far as I know, it's, that's unprecedented in any mill town I've ever heard of in the, in the North or the South. Now, this is Carver's third school building. This one, this building was actually built in 22. And um, what, you, what, what was originally located was just the building that you see here in front. This is the building uh, that is currently occupied by the fire department. But it, and it was built in the mid '50s to serve as an auditorium for uh, uh, you know a, a place of recreation and uh, uh, small community uh, pr uh, projects that would go on and entertainment, whatever. But the uh, you see that little bitty skinny tree in front of you. That's that that magnificent elm tree that stands in front of town hall right now. Yeah, and the, you, you notice that the uh, there's no porch here this you just walk straight into the building you know, they uh, when the town bought the building you know they put a porch on it the original auditorium was located uh, up on the second story in these 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 windows here that was the auditorium and when it, school and the community became big enough that they actually needed more space so they built this auditorium on the side and it just became an entertainment venue and whatever this is my first grade class and that that cute little guy right there is me in, in 1951, sitting in Mrs. Ethelene Strugelbaker's class, which is now, where the boardroom is now. Um, and unfortunately, most of the folks that you see sitting there in the class with me, about, well, well over half of them have, have since passed. And we have a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of just good old, good old boys there. Uh, but some of the adventures we did when we were in school was this picture is my, a picture of my class was taken down at the Thrifty Food Store, which uh, was a, a local uh, grocery store that uh, was just down the street. It's where the, the Community Works uh, thrift shop is now. Uh, and it was uh, it was owned and operated by some a uh, couple of local guys. And we took a field trip one day, and that's what this picture was. You know, we saw the meat lockers and the, where they had storage and stuff downstairs. At that time, and this is, like I said, 51, 52, Barbara had seven locally owned grocery stores on Main Street. Those grocery stores have mostly now been replaced by restaurants. This was back in the day when people actually cooked at home instead of going out to eat all the time. But um, this, yeah, there were there were seven different grocery stores on the Main Street of Carver that were all, you know, uh, owner-occupied uh, businesses. A couple of my favorite teachers in, in Carver Elementary School. Agnes Andrews was my third grade teacher and she was also the school librarian. Uh, and our classroom uh, in the third grade was in the library. We had it, and this of course lady is, is a, she's, she still was with Miss, Miss Virginia Grantham, who was uh, a merit. Her father was Eben Merritt, you know, a merit's grill. So yeah, a little bit of a, some uh, local uh, celebrities here. We had a lot of early, there was a lot of early act, school activities, you know, the things that went on. We had, this was the, uh, uh, girls Glee Club uh, in, I think, what's it, 1937. And uh, any of you that know uh, uh, Frances Shetley, this is, a, this is a picture of Frances when she was uh, just, a, just a little kid, you know, she, she's in, the, in the, uh, the Glee Club. The person who headed up the Glee Club is named Mae Clark. Uh, and that's, that's her standing at the top of the stairs. This is the May Queen. This was in 1935, I've been told. And uh, the story that goes with this is the, the little girl standing here to the uh, left on the front is, was actually the one who was elected as May Queen. But the principal of the school at the time thought that the May Queen ought to be blonde and have curly hair or something. So she decided that to choose this girl who won the second place. And this girl's name was, was Carly Williams. And Carly and this girl were, whose name was Rachel Bland were best of friends I grew up together and she Carly said that Rachel was very gracious and did not object to being you know being taken off the May Queen at all but it's just for some reason personal preferences here we go the May pole here in the front yard and I say this was this was taken before that elm tree was even there 
uh, because it's, you know it's not there. And if you you know we used to do this every every year. I had you know the maypole dance and whatever. It was one of the school uh, a band. One of the classes would have school bands. Carver was when Carver students um, went to the Carver Elementary for grades one through eight. When, until the 60s, uh, Carver School did not have a kindergarten. Um, so we, we, it was what, grades one through eight, and then you went to Chapel High School to go to high school because uh, that was the only high school in Southern Orange County at the time. Um, this is a graduation exercise in the in mid 50s. And if any of you recognize like, you know, the little guy sitting down here in the, the little, little uh, dress up white suit, that's Dickie Andrews. He's currently you know, a realtor. Uh, uh, here in, in town in one of the long-term families uh, in uh, Carver. Here's, um, this picture was taken in the actual old, old auditorium in the school. This is this is Mr. Mac Watts sitting right here. And this is his son. And this was a band that he had to organize. And they, they used to, they would do, you know, we, we would have local entertainment, and whatever. And this, this was some of the, the things that would happen. This was a, a, the picture in the bottom right here was the, that's the bride and the groom at a womanless wedding that was held in the school auditorium to, as, just as a fundraiser you know, to, for the school. It's, most of these things we had a minimum mission, but we used it for, for fun. Here, you know, some of the classes had, would have you know, shows and whatever, and, they, and these would be things to put on for the parents to attend and whatever. And here, this was part of a, another quote talent show. Unquote. This, the lady singing out of the Vogue magazine. That's my mother. And uh, they just, you know, we were. Everybody was involved in something in the community. You know, back in the fifties, the town was small enough. The town only had about fifteen hundred to sixteen hundred people, um, and back then, so it was it was small enough to involve anybody and everybody. We used to have things, you know, there, we'd have raffles. This happens to be my brother and a, and a friend of his signing up for a raffle. I don't even know what they were raffling. But there was, we also had another, another picture of baby contest. It was a, you know, the cutest baby contest. Who they get the, the most dressed up and then they, you know, you voted with, with money. And that was how they decided winners. The talent shows. This, this was a group, a group of, of guys from the elementary school. Um, and the group was called the Blue Jeans. And that little guy sitting on the, the front right there, that's me. Uh, this uh, group you see here standing in the front door, this was the Tom Thumb wedding. And, you know, earlier I mentioned and showed you a picture of uh, uh, Mr. Andrews, Dick Andrews. Well, this was Dickie's father, Raymond Andrews, who was the bride of the groom. And this was the bride, you know, in the, in the Tom Thumb wedding. This was a lunchroom, and, and this lady happens to be Mr. Watts' wife. And, you know, here we are. That happens to be my first grade teacher, but this was, at, I wasn't in the first grade then. This was afterwards sometime. In the mid-1950s, things got a little disruptive in the county. Um, this is White Cross School, which is out on the White Cross community on 54 West from, you know, Carborough, about uh, 10 miles out. Um, the community, this school, this had been an Orange County school, and uh, in the mid 1950s, there weren't enough kids to actually keep the school going. So what the county decided to do was close down White Cross School and bus these kids to Carborough. Uh, and this happened in, I believe, 1956 and 57 is when it started. And they uh, they had uh, there was a lot of a uh, lot of uh, discontent and whatever within the community because. School and I have not been able to find out exactly how long the school has been around, but it, um, it's uh, it, for many many years. It was several generations of of folks in the White Cross community went to school here, and it's um, uh, so they were they felt uh, you know abandoned and deserted that their their schools had been taken away from them, and uh, they let us at Carver School know about it. Now Carver's fourth school, which is the current school that we have right now was was built in 1958 and when Carver was still an Orange County school and um, school board at the time my father happened to be on the school board uh, at the time and they had uh, the, one of the superintendent wanted to use an existing plan that they had for the Cameron Park School which is the school up here on the left uh, which is on St. Mary's Road in Hillsborough and my father who was a building contractor said ain't no way 
So that it, that building it, it still does. It reminds me of a Russian prison camp. It looks looks like a just a looks. A, it's a very boring looking building. It's just a flat top brick building. You know, it has no no architectural uh, esteem to it at all. So my dad and several others got busy and found uh, looked around and, and found some architects and got a design that was award winning. We ended up with a school, and it was the only school in. Orange County that would have an auditorium large enough to seat the entire school population. They could seat the uh, the school kids and two sittings in the in the uh, cafeteria, uh, so they didn't have to have lots and lots of, of uh, separation there. And it had a library large enough and uh, a gym, a magnificent gym for the time. It was state of the art. This was the dedication of the current Carver School. This is the cafeteria, and uh, some of uh, a lot of people that are a lot of locals here. This guy right here happens to be a first cousin of mine. Here's uh, the more the dedication of when it was done an evening. The, the gentleman standing here is Don Stanford, uh, and he was the chairman of the uh, Board of Education at the time. The gentleman standing beside him is the principal of Carver at the time, named a fellow named Clay Kenneth Keith Box, AKK Box. Uh, and the gentleman standing here facing them was a representative for the con construction company that built the, built the building. This is an aerial view of the Carver School as we know it now. And look at you know, look at how bare this area looked, that piece of town compared to now. You know, it's it's just full of houses and whatever now. Okay, that that basically uh, is covers Carver the history of Carver Schools up to. 1960 or so. Uh, anybody have any questions or any, any comments they want to make? Well, if not, we'll proceed. But there were other schools in our community. And what you see here is a map of uh, what uh, this was 1934, and it's, it's identified as Chapel Hill and Carver with the Negro community. This area is here is identified as Potter's Field. We now know as Northside. It, uh, it came to be called Northside sometime in the 40s. Um, and what you see here is the, uh, um, uh, the area I'm pointing to up here, there's a little T. That's the, uh, what we know as new as Northside School or the early Lincoln High School. And one of the earliest schools that I know that was dedicated for uh, the, the black children in the, in the county was a couple fellow named Morris Hogan and his wife, Panthea. Um, and Morris had, had been, a, uh, his family had been uh, slaves in the Hogan family. And um, during uh, reconstruction, Morris and his wife opened a school out on Eubanks Road. Uh, and there's now an elementary school there called the Morris Grove Elementary School. They had a, a small, uh, private school there for uh, the black kids in that community and whatever. And uh, this, what you see on the, on the right hand here is, is their graves. Uh, and uh, they're a very at uh, Hickory Grove Baptist Church uh, out off of um, Highway 54. This is a picture of the students of Mars Grove Elementary uh, or the academy or whatever uh, in in, in the circa 1900, I have been told. And uh, they're standing what is on the porch, which is, which is supposedly about 50 yards from the existing school, the new school that stands there now. On, it's on uh, Eubanks Road. This is a map of Carver Chapel Hill. The, the dotted line you see here, that's the Carver Chapel Hill border. And this is basic, what we now call Merritt Mill Road. This is basically Rose, uh, you know, East Main Street and Rosemary Street uh, in, in Carver Chapel Hill. And what you see right here, if you want to point it to you, it says private, a primary school Negro. This school was built in the late 1800s. The, there was a uh, group uh, of Quakers or the Friends community from Philadelphia that sent a man down here named George Dixon. I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, yeah. Fellow named George Dixon came down and organized and set up a school for former slaves uh, that was to be uh, try to teach these folks to read and write. Of course, it, it, 
you know, it was illegal um, in most places in the South for slaves to be able to to read and write. And so they they uh, sent some folks down here after the, the war was over and uh, organized the school and set it up. And they built it on land that uh, that was donated by a fellow named George Cordell and Benjamin Craig. These were these were both black gentlemen, and they they also bought a piece of property that where the St. Paul AME Church is. So you, if you see here's where it says it says right here Quaker School, and then uh, AME Church is, is right here St. Paul. The how the what we know now as you know, you know West Main Street or East Main Street and West Franklin. Did not exist at the time. This is this uh, dates to about 1925. This map does. But uh, anyway, they had the uh, they had set up the first school for blacks in the county, uh, uh, as far as being after you know after the Civil War was over, and before the county ever organized any schools. That school basically stood where the car wash is now. Uh, this this is Carolina Car Wash. Uh, on uh, uh, East Main Street in Carborough, and um, the uh, the owner of the uh, the car wash, fellow Tommy Tucker, had asked the Carborough uh, Truth Plaque Committee to to put say about putting a plaque here denoting the fact that this was the first you know black school in uh, in Orange County, uh, and we have been working with the the, the committee has been working with. Uh, the Department of Transportation, or whatever, to get approval to put uh, put a plaque on the street, and uh, it's hopefully soon to be in place. It will. It's probably going to be located actually on the uh, St. Paul side uh, of the street, and um, but um, it, it's not there yet. But we're working on it. This building was originally built as a uh, as a Buick dealership in the early, like 1952 to 1953. Uh, just. There are also was also later on, and this is the this, the, the Quaker school as we just talked about. Uh, but further down here on this map, and this is uh, further on in nineteen in nineteen fifteen, you'll see it says uh, a graded colored school or ne graded Negro school, um, and it, this was what was known as the um, uh, Hackney School. Reverend Hackney, who was the, at that time the, the uh, pastor at what was White Rock Baptist Church, which later became First Baptist Church in Tapple Hill, uh, opened a school, and it was located further down Merritt Mill Road. And you'll notice that th this was this picture was uh, or map was taken even before the uh, because this is where the, uh, the the train comes in to go over to the campus. Uh, or up to the power plant, you know, when it breaks in coal. And this was before the train was, uh, train tracks were even there. This is a picture of Hackney School sitting on what is, what is now South uh, Merritt Mill Road. Uh, and this was, it was uh, in operation from basically 1898 to 19, uh, 1912. And, but it served only the lower grades and just a, a, a rudimentary elementary school. And then later on, uh, Reverend Hackney opened a school that was known as Hatt's High School uh, that became what we uh, when it was adopted by the county, uh, the county started funding it. It was uh, in, in the early 1900s, it was uh, known as Orange County Training School because it was assumed then that that, that black kids would, wouldn't go any further than maybe even high school. So it was a, basically a trade school to teach, teach black kids uh, a trade uh, because it was just assumed that they would not go on to higher education. But uh, anyway, the, the, the county uh, in 1916 took over both of the schools because of uh, some inadequate funding. Uh, and they, they uh, created what we now call Orange County Training, uh, Training School. And uh, until 1922, when the school burned down and then there was no school and uh, no building, and uh, the children were taught in various people's homes around the community at that time. This is what that Quaker school building looked like in 1916. Uh, and this is, we're looking south as if you're looking down the Merritt Mill Road is over, is over on to, to our, our left side of the picture. This is a picture of the Quaker school teachers and students in circa 1903. And where they're standing is actually in front of St. Paul AME Church. 
this was when the church was originally built. It was built as a as a wood frame building. You say it has the this the, you know fibers on the side here. It has since been bricked up, but this is this is still where the front door is, main entrance to the church. And uh, you're, they're basically standing, the photographer standing uh, in the middle of what is now Merritt Mill Road. Uh, in 19, the 1920s, NC-54, you see here, it says NC-54 was put into, in, and so this road was cut in what it, into what we now know as uh, you know, uh, East Main Street, West Franklin Street. And so the school building, you know, the church is right here, you can see. And um, so the, the school building was sitting here in, in what was what is now the, the highway, and it had to be moved back. And then because you know this is this is where the car wash is sitting now, if you if you can you know envision that. This is basically Brewer Lane. And um, so this the school was had to be moved back to, to get it off the road. And it continued to be in operation there until or the building was there until the early 50s when the, the beer dealership was built. And then the then the school building itself, what remained of it, was moved off to the side over here. Here's another picture of the school building that, that that's what it looked like in 1917. And then this uh, picture was taken in uh, 1951 after the school, the building, the Buick dealership was built. And the, you see the arrow that there's a little building back in here. That's what was left of the, the original Quaker school. It was moved over to the basement, the outside of their, the, the car lot for the Buick place. Uh, and next to the, uh, there's a, another church that's back there. Uh, that's uh, and it's that's that was moved. What you see here, this this building is now known as uh, Crook's Corner, and uh, at this time it was owned by uh, Rachel Crook and operated as a as her as a market in the 1950s before she was tragically killed. So in 1922, the Hacks High School, the original uh, Orange County Training School, burned down. And so they, they, like I said, while they had, when they didn't have any, any building, they just taught around different places in town. Well, they got an organization going and, and well, I'll advance one slide here. You ever, anybody ever heard of the Rosenwald schools? Rosenwald was a, uh, he was a Jewish immigrant. He was a Russian Jew that came into the United States in the early 1800s, or the, actually late 1800s, and ended up in Chicago. and being a very ambitious and industrious man, he went to work for a company called Sears and Roebuck as a clerk. And in about 20 years, he was the uh, CEO and, and president of, uh, of Sears and Roebuck. Consequently, he was a very rich man. And so <coughs> based on his own struggles, he knew about the struggles of the blacks and education in the South. He set up a foundation to actually <coughs> assist with building schools for uh, black communities all over the South and in, uh, in about, uh, I think, 15 different, count 15 different states. North Carolina alone had over 800 of these school buildings built. And one of them was what we now call the uh, old Orange County, uh, Orange County Training School or the original Lincoln High School. Um, <clears throat> the, the, built, <clears throat> the building was built as a cooperative venture. The part of the uh, Religion Wall program was that they would provide plans because he had he had plans, uh, architects draw up plans for uh, buildings from one room schoolhouses to up to about 10 room schoolhouses. And you could take the plans, build it. It was designed to use stock sized lumber. Um, and it had to be built in the community by the community. The community raised money to buy some of the materials. He would, uh, Religion Wall would donate money and assist with, with you know, the, the, uh, not in the fabrication, but at least some of the organization and administration to get the schools built. Uh, and this one was actually built as a nine-room school, even though uh, the plans uh, that they used called for a six-room school. And this was the, the classic Rosenwald documentation to design the school. And as you see, this the school was built on a hill, slope side, so when it was built, they on the left-hand side, they added three more classrooms on the hillside into the hillside, and uh, so ended up with a nine-room classroom, which had an auditorium and offices and library and, and whatever. So it was well. These the buildings were designed 
to be situated, they were situated on their properties so that they could take advantage of natural light in places where there was no, was no electricity, you know, many places across the South in the early 1900s had no, no electricity. Orange County Training School opened in 1924, and here we see the principal and some teachers in 1925 sitting on the front, front entrance of the, of the school. This is uh, Mr. Bozeman, who was the principal, and this is his wife here, and some of the other teachers. And one gentleman, Arthur McMaster, if you know this, McMaster Street in Chapel Hill, it's over close to the Northside community, uh, was kind enough to uh, let me actually uh, take a picture of, of his diploma from the Orange County Training School. Uh, and uh, so as, a, as a, a cherished memento. Of course, Lincoln was, uh, being a black school, it, they, had, uh, they had their own activities and whatever. They were famous, you know, were infamous in many cases with their football team because they, they had a, a, just a very aggressive uh, uh, football team and they, they were in contention every year when it comes for championships and whatever. Uh, they did win a state championship uh, in the late 40s and uh, early 50s. And uh, one time during that season, they beat one school, I forget who it was, but they, they beat, uh, beat the other school 64 to nothing. <laughs> these, these number of these students, these, these people could have played football for Carolina at the time. They were, they were that good. And the reason they were that good was because of the gentleman you see, you know, Crouch, this was Coach Bob Pierman. Uh, and he, was, he was the coach and he knew, knew what he was doing. And when Car the Carbera <coughs> and uh, schools were, uh, Carbera and Chapel Hill schools were integrated, uh, Coach Pierman was still the, the football coach at Lincoln at the time, and, but he was made an assistant coach at Chapel Hill High, and it, um, the, <coughs> but he was not given any authority, uh, really, and, uh, and um, the, the, the black students who, who would, had been former, former players for him, uh, the, they boycotted uh, the, the uh, football team one year, and no black students played in, the, I think it was 1968, uh, and uh, played simply because of the way Coach Pierman had been treated by the administration. Mm. The, um, this is a, a meeting we had one time with, uh, this, out in the county, uh, those, you remember those little circles I showed you all over the, uh, the uh, Orange County map. There was one, a school located out on Hickory Grove, Bethel Church Road, that was known as Hickory Grove School, which was for the, uh, the, the black kids in the area and um lady uh, <coughs> named natalie borman bought the building it was going to be torn down but she bought the building had it moved up onto highway 54 and she she is a clinical psychologist and she, she uses it as a workshop and as a uh, as a, uh, a a meeting place with her clients and but she knew some of the students that lived in the area that were actually attended school in this little two-room schoolhouse. And so we organized it, but she organized a meet with myself and Dave Otto when we were working on writing our, our first Carborough history book. And we, we met with these, these uh, students and just got their perspective on going to school, you know, and, and talking about how, 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 <coughs> how the schools operated. And were several things they mentioned. One of them was they said they uh, they took turns coming to school in the morning. Uh, uh, they would like one a week at a time or a month at a time. Students would come in early, and they would uh, if it was cold, you know, they'd build a fire in the little pot belly stove to warm the classroom up, and they would go get a bucket of water that they could have for drinking water and for washing hands and stuff uh, at at a nearby well. There was no well, no water at the school, and. Uh, so what they would do is they would uh, they would go over and get a bucket of water and bring and bring it back and have it for there. And so one time they had a problem with worms in the well, and so what they did they just filtered just poured the water through a rag and you know, got all the worms out of the water and just used it. It was what they had. It was they really had no choice. This is a picture of the school as it looks today. It's, it's, it's if you know on Highway 54 where Neville Road. Uh, runs into Highway 54. This is right across the street from Neville Road. It's back up in the woods. If you don't look, you wouldn't see it. And these were the students that we met out on the porch and we talked to them. Reverend Manley, uh, who was the uh, 
minister for many, many years at the uh, First Baptist Church, was also the first black uh, person in town to be elected to the Chapel Hill Carborough uh, School Board. And this was, he was elected in 1959. And of course, the schools were segregated at that time. And when he, at the end of his tenure, he served until 1965. And in 1965, the schools were almost totally integrated. Chapel Hill High was not integrated at that time. But that was the last school, I believe, that was not integrated. But uh, they, uh, as is pointed out here, the African community bore, really bore the weight of the transition because they, very little consideration was given to the student. The, the black students were basically just moved into the white schools and, um, and no consideration was made for, for very many of their feelings and whatever. And um, you know, the, the, the other, the former schools, the uh, uh, Northside School, the, which had, at that time had been converted to a uh, uh, elementary school, uh, was uh, basically closed. And Lincoln, the Lincoln High School, which had been the black high school, was effectively closed, but it was, it was used for one year uh, as an all, uh, all sixth graders because they had a real bubble of uh, no, too many sixth graders for all the elementaries. So they just created a sixth grade school at Lincoln, uh, with Lincoln High in uh, and that was that was for one year, and I believe in 1968 or 67, 68. And then after that, you know, the Lincoln the Lincoln building was you know, eventually converted to what the, the Lincoln Center administrative offices that we now know. And uh, <coughs> the uh, there was uh, other schools were built uh, during Dr. Manley's tenure. One of them was the, the Frank Porter Graham Elementary. And which was built on land uh, from purchased from Ms. Lucy, Lucy Craig and Miss Bessie Cordell and Chapel, uh, Chapel Hill High property was, was. And if you remember those names, those were the names of the folks that bought the property and dedicated the property for the Quaker school that was built uh, almost 100 years before. So, you know, there's this, these two families, the full circle. And, the, and black education and and, uh, and Chapel Hill Carboros, and I think I think it's a pretty pretty unique occurrence. If you've been in Chapel Hill at all, you know about the Smith family. Mr. R. D. Smith and his wife Uzell uh, moved to the area in, 19, in the early 1940s and got er, early on got involved in the school system, and both of them both of them taught and were administrators in the school system for 40 odd years, and. Um, and to honor the, these folks in 1999, the uh, Carver, you know, Chapel Hill Carver School System uh, named a new school in their honor, uh, the Smith uh, Smith Middle School, in their honor, and then uh, the, the Chapel Hill Historical Society later named both the, of the Smiths as town treasures in uh, 2008. Uh, Miss Miss uh, Uzel just recently died, just a few months ago, uh, and they were. They, they dedicated their entire lives to the school system. This gentleman on the left here is a fellow named Hilliard Caldwell. Hilliard was, uh, grew up in Chapel Hill, lived in Carborough and worked for many years in the Carborough school system and also served as a Carborough alderman. And here, he, uh, this his picture here with uh, Mr. R.D. Smith in the Lincoln Center. This, the display you see behind him is in, was in the hallway at the uh, Lincoln Center. Uh, building. This gentleman is Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Charles McDougall, who became principal of the uh, uh, Orange County uh, Training School uh, in 1948, when it was still OCTS before it was named. Uh, name was changed to, to Lincoln High School, and then he, when the new Lincoln High School was built down on Merritt Mill Road, uh, he moved down there and continued as principal until the schools were uh, integrated and then he, and he, Mr. McDougall retired. Uh, and in his honor, uh, for the number of years that, that he served uh, at the, in the school system here, uh, Carborough now has two schools dedicated that, that were memorialized his name uh, and, uh, and, and his, his wife's name to, uh, to commemorate their, their work in the school system when, uh, he was principal and his wife was an elementary and high school teacher. And their careers also spanned over 40 years 
in the system. And uh, so they, you know, they had meant quite a lot to the community. And uh, after the, after the, uh, the uh, before, during, and even after the, uh, the schools were fully integrated. And of course, Carver is now a big enough community, you know, what used to be a little town of about 1500 people now approaches what, 20,000 people. So we, we have demanded our own school. And of course, Carver now has its, its own high school, which is of course fully integrated and, and serves the Carver and um, you know southern uh, southern Orange County area there um, for uh, for as a high school. Um, shameless commercial here. If you're interested in learning more about uh, Carver history, uh, these are Dave Otto and I wrote a couple of books. Uh, the one on the left we wrote to, to commemorate, it came out in 2001 to, the, uh, to commemorate Carborough's Bicentennial, 2011, I'm sorry. Uh, and this basically takes Carborough's history from before it was actually Carborough up until the 1950s. And then this book on the right uh, is basically 1950s to the present day. And uh, the one on the left is black and white, the one on the right is, is color. And if you're interested, Dave and I have them and for sale, and we'd be, be glad to impart them upon you, to you. Thank you for your participation and uh, patience with me. I'm, I'm not the, the greatest of speakers, but anyway. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments or uh, anything you'd like to say or, or any, any additional questions? Yes, uh, Richard, I'd like to know if there was any attention paid to uh, Native Americans or Okanichis in all of this um, in the school systems in classification, because, you know, uh, the earlier schools um, in Northern Orange were, you know, uh, they were not Native Americans, they were, um, they were not identified as Native Americans. Exactly. Do you have information on that? Uh, no, well, with the uh, Within the Chapel Hill Carver School System area, there was no no special consideration made at all for any of the indigenous peoples at all. Because to my knowledge, there, there was not a large enough community to even identify in Southern Orange. Um, and you know, most most of the uh, what we now what we now refer to as the Sapanis or the Okanichi uh, mm -hmm. people were located in the uh, Central Orange County and up and even in, up into the northwest portions of the county. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I do not, I am not aware of any consideration that was given to them for county as far as having any kind of separate schools. Uh, I don't, do not believe that there, there, uh, that there were any separate schools. I think they were just incorporated into the school system that existed in the county, but I do not know that for a fact. I haven't mm -hmm. done any research in that area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I mean, you're always you're always looking for more information, right? So anybody who's got more information just has to get it to you because sure. um, you know photographs, all these things. Because I'm yeah. sure people at home have things they don't really know they've got, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. If anyone has any, has any information that I that you've not mm -hmm. heard here, or if you just have any anything incidental, you know, regarding the history of Carver and, and whatever, I I would definitely love to know about it. And uh, so, yeah, here's my contact information. F please feel free to give me a buzz, uh, drop me an email, and um, I would I would love to talk with you, uh, see what materials you might have, or or answer any questions and provide more materials that I might might have that you might be interested in. So, I've been I've been collecting materials for a long 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 time, and uh, if you've got something for something that you're particularly interested in, I might be able to, to offer you some information about it. Thank you so much, Richard. You are always so interesting every time you give. Thank it. you. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, Richard. I really appreciate the time you always put into this, and Carver appreciates everything you do. Thank you so much, Jackie. I I I do it out of enjoyment, love for my community. Thank you.